Tertullian, full name Quintus Septimius Florens Tertullianus, c. 155 c. 240 AD was a prolific early Christian author from Carthage in the Roman province of Africa. Of Berber origin, he was the first Christian author to produce an extensive corpus of Latin Christian literature. He also was an early Christian apologist and a polemicist against heresy, including contemporary Christian Gnosticism. Tertullian has been called the father of Latin Christianity and the founder of Western theology. Though conservative in his worldview, Tertullian originated new theological concepts and advanced the development of early church doctrine. He is perhaps most famous for being the first writer in Latin known to use the term Trinity Latin, Trinitas. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Tertullian's Trinity is not a triune God, but rather a triad or group of three, with God as the founding member. A similar word had been used earlier in Greek, though Tertullian gives the oldest extant use of the terminology as later incorporated into the Nicene Creed at the Second Ecumenical Council, the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, or as the Athanasian Creed, or both. Other Latin formulations that first appear in his work are three persons, one substance as the Latin, tres personae, una substantia, consubstantial, in English, itself from the Koine Greek, tris hypostases, homoiseoi, influenced by Stoic philosophy, the substance of Tertullian, however, was a material substance that did not refer to a single God, but to the sharing of a portion of the substance of the Father the only being who was fully God with the Son and, through the Son, with the Holy Spirit, he wrote his understanding of the three members of the Trinity after becoming a Montanist. Unlike many Church Fathers, Tertullian was never recognized as a saint by the Eastern or Western Catholic tradition churches. Several of his teachings on issues such as the clear subordination of the Son and Spirit to the Father, and his condemnation of remarriage for widows and of fleeing from persecution, contradicted the doctrines of these traditions. Life Scant reliable evidence exists to inform us about Tertullian's life, most history about him comes from passing references in his own writings. Roman Africa was famous as the home of orators and this influence can be seen in his writing style with its archaisms or provincialisms, its glowing imagery and its passionate temper. He was a scholar with an excellent education. He wrote at least three books in Greek. In them he refers to himself, but none of these is extant. According to church tradition, Tertullian was raised in Carthage and was thought to be the son of a Roman centurion. Tertullian has been claimed to have been a trained lawyer and an ordained priest. These assertions rely on the accounts of Eusebius of Caesarea, church history, 2, e. 4, and Jerome's De Viris Illustribus on famous men, chapter 53. Jerome claimed that Tertullian's father held the position of Centurio Proconsularis, aide de camp, in the Roman army in Africa. However, it is unclear whether any such position in the Roman military ever existed. Further, Tertullian has been thought to be a lawyer based on his use of legal analogies and an identification of him with the jurist Tertullianus, who is quoted in the Pandects. Although Tertullian used a knowledge of Roman law in his writings, his legal knowledge does not demonstrably exceed that of what could be expected from a sufficient Roman education. 
The writings of Tertullianus, a lawyer of the same cognomen, exist only in fragments and do not denote a Christian authorship. Tertullianus was misidentified only much later with the Christian Tertullian by church historians. Finally, any notion of Tertullian being a priest is also questionable. In his extant writings, he never describes himself as ordained in the church and seems to place himself among the laity. His conversion to Christianity perhaps took place about 197 to 198 CF. Adolf Harnack, Bonwetch, and others, but its immediate antecedents are unknown except as they are conjectured from his writings. The event must have been sudden and decisive, transforming at once his own personality. He said of himself that he could not imagine a truly Christian life without such a conscious breach, a radical act of conversion. Christians are made, not born. Apol, XVIII. Two books addressed to his wife confirm that he was married to a Christian wife. In middle life, about 207, he was attracted to the new prophecy of Montanism, though today most scholars reject St. Jerome's assertion that Tertullian ever left the mainstream church or was ever excommunicated. W. E. are left to ask whether Saint Cyprian could have regarded Tertullian as his master if Tertullian had been a notorious schismatic. Since no ancient writer was more definite if not indeed fanatical on this subject of schism than Cyprian, the question must surely be answered in the negative." In the time of Augustine, a group of Tertullianists still had a basilica in Carthage which, within that same period, passed to the Orthodox Church. It is unclear whether the name was merely another for the Montanists or that this means Tertullian later split with the Montanists and founded his own group. Jerome says that Tertullian lived to a great age, but there is no reliable source attesting to his survival beyond the estimated year 225 AD. By the doctrinal works he published, Tertullian became the teacher of Cyprian and the predecessor of Augustine, who, in turn, became the chief founder of Latin theology. Writings Topic General Character Thirty one works are extant, together with fragments of more. Some fifteen works in Latin or Greek are lost, some as recently as the 9th century De Paradiso, De Superstitione Siaculi, De Carnie Anima were all extant in the now damaged Codex Agobardinus in 814 AD. Tertullian's writings cover the whole theological field of the time. Apologetics against paganism and Judaism, polemics, polity, discipline, and morals, or the whole reorganization of human life on a Christian basis, they gave a picture of the religious life and thought of the time which is of the greatest interest to the church historian. Tertullian did not hesitate to call his opponents blind, utterly perverse, or utterly stupid. Topic. Chronology and contents The chronology of these writings is difficult to fix with certainty. It is in part determined by the Montanistic views that are set forth in some of them, by the author's own allusions to this writing, or that, as antedating others cf. Harnack, Literaturi.260 to 262, and by definite historic data, e.g., the reference to the death of Septimius Severus, ad scapulum, IV. 
in his work against Marcion, which he calls his third composition on the Marcionite heresy, he gives its date as the fifteenth year of the reign of Severus ADV. Marcion M. I.1, 15 which would be approximately the year 208. The writings may be divided with reference to the two periods of Tertullian's Christian activity, the mainstream and the Montanist cf. Harnack, e.262 sqq, or according to their subject matter. The object of the former mode of division is to show, if possible, the change of views Tertullian's mind underwent. Following the latter mode, which is of a more practical interest, the writings fall into two groups. Apologetic and polemic writings, like Apologeticus, De Testimonio Anime, the Anti-Jewish De Adversus Judios, ADV. Marcionem, ADV. Praxum, ADV. Hermogenum, De Prescription Hereticorum, and Scorpius were written to counteract Gnosticism and other religious or philosophical doctrines. The other group consists of practical and disciplinary writings, e.g., De Monogamia, Ad Uxorum, De Virginibus Velandus, De Cultu Feminarum, De Patientia, De Pedicitia, De Oratione, and Ad Martyrs. Among his apologetic writings, the Apologeticus, addressed to the Roman magistrates, is a most pungent defense of Christianity and the Christians against the reproaches of the pagans, and an important legacy of the ancient church, proclaiming the principle of freedom of religion as an inalienable human right and demands a fair trial for Christians before they are condemned to death. Tertullian was the first to disprove such charges as that the Christians sacrificed infants at the celebration of the Lord's Supper and committed incest. He pointed to the commission of such crimes in the pagan world and then proved by the testimony of Pliny the Younger that Christians pledged themselves not to commit murder, adultery, or other crimes. He adduced also the inhumanity of pagan customs such as feeding the flesh of gladiators to beasts. He argued that the gods have no existence and thus there is no pagan religion against which Christians may offend. Christians do not engage in the foolish worship of the emperors, that they do better, they pray for them, and that Christians can afford to be put to torture and to death, and the more they are cast down the more they grow. The blood of the martyrs is seed. Apologeticum, 50. In the De Prescription he develops as its fundamental idea that, in a dispute between the Church and a separating party, the whole burden of proof lies with the latter, as the Church, in possession of the unbroken tradition, is by its very existence a guarantee of its truth. The five books against Marcion, written in 207 or 208, are the most comprehensive and elaborate of his polemical works, invaluable for gauging the early Christian view of Gnosticism. Of the moral and ascetic treatises, the De Patientia and De Spectaculus are among the most interesting, and the De Pedicitia and De Virginibus Velandis among the most characteristic. Tertullian has been identified by Joanne McNamara as the person who originally invested the consecrated virgin as the Bride of Christ, which helped to bring the independent virgin under patriarchal rule. Topic: Theology. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> General character. Though thoroughly conversant with the Greek theology, Tertullian remained independent of its metaphysical speculations. He had learned from the Greek Apologies, and offered a direct contrast to Oregon of Alexandria, who drew many of his theories regarding creation from Middle Platonism. Tertullian carried his realism to the verge of materialism. 
This is evident from his ascription to God of corporea T and his acceptance of the Traducian theory of the origin of the soul. He despised Greek philosophy, and, far from looking at Plato, Aristotle, and other Greek thinkers whom he quotes as forerunners of Christ and the Gospel, he pronounces them the patriarchal forefathers of the heretics de anima e. He held up to scorn their inconsistency when he referred to the fact that Socrates in dying ordered a cock to be sacrificed to Aesculapius de anima, I. Tertullian always wrote under stress of a felt necessity. He was never so happy as when he had opponents like Marcion and Praxeus, and, however abstract the ideas may be which he treated, he was always moved by practical considerations to make his case clear and irresistible. It was partly this element which gave to his writings a formative influence upon the theology of the post-Nicene period in the West and has rendered them fresh reading to this day. Although he was by nature a polemicist no mention is made of his name by other authors during the 3rd century. Lactantius at the opening of the 4th century is the first to do so, Augustine, however, treats him with respect. Cyprian, Tertullian's North African compatriot, though nowhere mentioning his name, was well read in his writings, according to Cyprian's secretary in a letter to Jerome. <laughs> <laughs> Specific teachings Tertullian's main doctrinal teachings are as follows. The soul was not pre-existent, as Plato affirmed, nor subject to metempsychosis or reincarnation, as the Pythagoreans held. In each individual it is a new product, proceeding equally with the body from the parents, and not created later and associated with the body de anima, XXVII. This position is called traducianism in opposition to creationism, or the idea that each soul is a fresh creation of God. The soul's sinfulness is easily explained by its traducian origin de anima, XXXIX. It is in bondage to Satan, whose works it renounces in baptism, but has seeds of good de anima, xli, and when awakened, it passes to health and at once calls upon God apol, xvii, and is naturally Christian. It exists in all men alike, it is a culprit and yet an unconscious witness by its impulse to worship, its fear of demons, and its musings on death to the power, benignity, and judgment of God as revealed in the Christian scriptures de testimonio, vivi. Tertullian reserves the appellation God, in the sense of the ultimate originator of all things, to the Father, who made the world out of nothing through his Son, the Word, has corporeity though he is a spirit de prescription, vii, adv. praxum, vii. However Tertullian used «corporeal» only in the Stoic sense, to mean something with actual material existence, rather than the later idea of flesh. Tertullian is often considered an early proponent of the Nicene doctrine, approaching the subject from the standpoint of the Logos doctrine, though he did not state the later doctrine of the immanent trinity. In his treatise against Praxeus, who taught patripassionism in Rome, he used the words trinity, economy, used in reference to the three persons, persons, and substance. Maintaining the distinction of the Son from the Father as the unoriginate God, and the Spirit from both the Father and the Son, ADV. Praxum, XXV. These three are one substance, not one person, and it is said, I and my Father are one in respect not of the singularity of number but the unity of the substance." The very names, Father and Son, indicate the distinction of personality. 
the Father is one, the Son is another, and the Spirit is another. Deco allium esse patrum a allium filium a allium spiritum. ADV. Praxum, Ix, and yet in defending the unity of God, he says the Son is not other. Elius a patra filius non est. ADV. Prax, 18, as a result of receiving a portion of the Father's substance. At times, speaking of the Father and the Son, Tertullian refers to two gods. He says that all things of the Father belong also to the Son, including his names, such as Almighty God, Most High, Lord of Hosts, or King of Israel. Though Tertullian considered the Father to be God Yahweh, he responded to criticism of the modalist Praxeus that this meant that Tertullian's Christianity was not monotheistic by noting that even though there was one God Yahweh, who became the Father when the Son became his agent of creation, the Son could also be referred to as God, when referred to apart from the Father, because the Son, though subordinate to God, is entitled to be called God, from the unity of the Father, in regards to being formed from a portion of his substance. The Catholic Encyclopedia comments that for Tertullian, there was a time when there was no son and no sin, when God was neither father nor judge. Similarly J.N.D. Kelly has stated, Tertullian followed the apologists in dating his perfect generation from his extrapolation for the work of creation. Prior to that moment, God could not strictly be said to have had a son, while after it the term father, which for earlier theologians generally connoted God as author of reality, began to acquire the specialized meaning of father and son. As regards the subjects of subordination of the Son to the Father, the New Catholic Encyclopedia has commented, "...in not a few areas of theology, Tertullian's views are, of course, completely unacceptable." Thus, for example, his teaching on the Trinity reveals a subordination of Son to Father that in the later crass form of Arianism the Church rejected as heretical. Though he did not fully state the doctrine of the immanence of the Trinity, according to B. B. Warfield, he went a long distance in the way of approach to it. In soteriology, Tertullian does not dogmatize, he prefers to keep silence at the mystery of the cross de patientia, e. The sufferings of Christ's life as well as of the crucifixion are efficacious to redemption. In the water of baptism, which upon a partial quotation of John chapter 3 verse 5 is made necessary de baptismo, vi, humans are born again, the baptized does not receive the Holy Spirit in the water, but is prepared for the Holy Spirit. Humans are little fishes. After the example of the ichthys, fish, Jesus Christ, are born in water, de baptismo, i. In discussing whether sins committed subsequent to baptism may be forgiven, Tertullian calls baptism and penance, two planks, on which the sinner may be saved from shipwreck language which he gave to the church. De penitentia, XII. With reference to the rule of faith, it may be said that Tertullian is constantly using this expression, and by it means now the authoritative tradition handed down in the Church, now the Scriptures themselves, and, perhaps, a definite doctrinal formula. While he nowhere gives a list of the books of Scripture, he divides them into two parts and calls them the Instrumentum and Testamentum ADV. Marcionem, IV.1. He distinguishes between the four Gospels and insists upon their apostolic origin as accrediting their authority de prescription, XXXVI, ADV. Marcionem, IV.1-5, in trying to account for Marcion's treatment of the Lucan Gospel and the Pauline writings he sarcastically queries whether the 
shipmaster from Pontus. Marcion had ever been guilty of taking on contraband goods or tampering with them after they were aboard ADV. Marcion M. V.1. The scripture, the rule of faith, is for him fixed and authoritative de corona, EIV. As opposed to the pagan writings they are divine de testimonio anime, vi. They contain all truth de prescription, vii, xiv, and from them the church drinks potat, her faith ADV. Praxim, xiii. The prophets were older than the Greek philosophers and their authority is accredited by the fulfillment of their predictions APOL, XIXXX. The scriptures and the teachings of philosophy are incompatible, insofar as the latter are the origins of sub-Christian heresies. "'What has Athens to do with Jerusalem?' he exclaims. "'Or the academy with the church?' De prescription, VII. Philosophy as pop paganism is a work of demons. De anima, I. The scriptures contain the wisdom of heaven. However, Tertullian was not averse to using the technical methods of Stoicism to discuss a problem. De anima. The rule of faith, however, seems to be also applied by Tertullian to some distinct formula of doctrine, and he gives a succinct statement of the Christian faith under this term de prescription, XIII. Tertullian was a defender of the necessity of apostolicity. In his prescription against heretics, he explicitly challenges heretics to produce evidence of the apostolic succession of their communities. Let them produce the original records of their churches, let them unfold the role of their bishops, running down in due succession from the beginning in such a manner that that first bishop of theirs bishop shall be able to show for his ordainer and predecessor some one of the apostles or of apostolic men a man, moreover, who continued steadfast with the apostles. For this is the manner in which the apostolic churches transmit their registers, as the Church of Smyrna, which records that Polycarp was placed therein by John, as also the Church of Rome, which makes Clement to have been ordained in like manner by Peter. In exactly the same way the other churches likewise exhibit their several worthies, whom, as having been appointed to their episcopal places by apostles, they regard as transmitters of the apostolic seed. Fornicators and murderers should never be readmitted into the church under any circumstances. In De Pudicitia, Tertullian condemns Pope Calixtus I for allowing such people to be readmitted if they show repentance. Topic: <laughs> Eschatology. Resurrection at the Second Coming Tertullian was a premillennialist, affirming a literal resurrection at the Second Advent of Jesus at the end of the world, not at death. Jesus, the stone that strikes and destroys the image concerning the image prophecy of Daniel 2, Tertullian identified Jesus, at his Second Advent, as the stone cut out of a mountain that strikes and destroys the image of secular kingdoms." He compares this with Daniel 7, Behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him before him, and there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Antichrist is the beast like Ioneus. Tertullian equated the Antichrist with the man of sin and the beast. He expected a specific Antichrist to appear as a persecutor of the Church just before the resurrection, under whom a second company of martyrs will be slain. 
Unlike Irenaeus, however, Tertullian does not consider the Antichrist to be a Jew sitting in a Jewish temple at Jerusalem. Rather, the Antichrist comes out of the Church. Rome symbolized as Babylon Tertullian applied the biblical figure of Babylon to the city of Rome and her domination. He portrayed Rome as drunk with the blood of martyred saints. Order of last days events they order of last days events according to Tertullian are the plagues Babylon's doom antichrist's warfare on the saints the devil cast into the bottomless pit the advent the resurrection of the saints the judgment and the second resurrection with the harvest at the end of the world and the sixth seal extending to the final dissolution of the earth and sky including the stars Millennium follows resurrection of the righteous dead. Tertullian maintained that the thousand years of revelation will follow the resurrection of the righteous dead on the earth with the new Jerusalem, preceding the eternity of heaven. The earth is destroyed after the one thousand years and the saints moved to the kingdom of heaven. Seventy weeks fulfilled by First Advent Tertullian contended that Daniel's seventy weeks foretold the time of Christ's incarnation and death. He started the seventy weeks from the first year of Darius, and continued to Jerusalem's destruction by the Romans under the command of Titus, fully completing the vision and prophecy. It is sealed by the advent of Christ, which he places at the end of the sixty-two and one-half weeks. <laughs> Moral principles Tertullian was a determined advocate of strict discipline and an austere code of practice, and like many of the African fathers, one of the leading representatives of the rigorist element in the early church. These views may have led him to adopt Montanism with its ascetic rigor and its belief in Chiliasm and the continuance of the prophetic gifts. In his writings on public amusements, the veiling of virgins, the conduct of women, and the like, he gives expression to these views. On the principle that we should not look at or listen to what we have no right to practice, and that polluted things, seen and touched, pollute de spectaculus, viii, xviii, he declared a Christian should abstain from the theatre and the amphitheatre. Their pagan religious rites were applied and the names of pagan divinities invoked, there the precepts of modesty, purity, and humanity were ignored or set aside, and there no place was offered to the onlookers for the cultivation of the Christian graces. Women should put aside their gold and precious stones as ornaments, and virgins should conform to the law of St. Paul for women and keep themselves strictly veiled de virginibus velandis. He praised the unmarried state as the highest de monogamia, xvii, ad uxorum, i.3 and called upon Christians not to allow themselves to be excelled in the virtue of celibacy by Vestal virgins and Egyptian priests. He even labeled second marriage a species of adultery, de exhortationis castitatis, ix, but this directly contradicted the epistles of the Apostle Paul. Tertullian's resolve to never marry again and that no one else should remarry eventually led to his break with Rome because the Orthodox Church refused to follow him in this resolve. He, instead, favored the Montanist sect where they also condemned second marriage. One reason for Tertullian's disdain for marriage was his belief about the transformation that awaited a married couple. He believed that marital relations coarsened the body and the soul and would dull their spiritual senses and avert the Holy Spirit since husband and wife became one flesh once married. Tertullian is sometimes criticized for being misogynistic, on the basis of the contents of his De Cultu Feminarum, section II, part II, trans. C. W. Marx, do you not know that you are Eve? 
The judgment of God upon this sex lives on in this age, therefore, necessarily the guilt should live on also. You are the gateway of the devil, you are the one who unseals the curse of that tree, and you are the first one to turn your back on the divine law, you are the one who persuaded him whom the devil was not capable of corrupting, you easily destroyed the image of God, Adam. Because of what you deserve, that is, death, even the Son of God had to die. Tertullian had a radical view on the cosmos. He believed that heaven and earth intersected at many points and that it was possible for there to be sexual relations with supernatural beings. Works <laughs> <laughs> Tertullian's writings are edited in volumes 1 to 2 of the Patrologia Latina, and modern texts exist in the Corpus Christianorum Latinorum. English translations by Sidney Thelwall and Philip Holmes can be found in volumes 3 and IV of the Anti Nicene Fathers, which are freely available online. More modern translations of some of the works have been made. Apologetic Apologeticus pro Christianize. Dissertatio Moschim in Apol. Libri duo ad nationis. De testimonio anime. Ad martyrs. De spectaculus. De idololatria. Exceedit ad scapulum liber. Dissertatio di la Nori in Apologet, Libr. 2 ad Nat, A Libr, ad Scapulum, Polemicald Oratione. De Baptismo. De Poenitentia. De Patientia. Ad Uxorum Libri Duo. De Cultu Feminarum Lib. 2, Dogmatic de Corona Melitis. De fuga in persecutione. Adversus nostico Scorpius. Adversus praxum. Adversus hermogenum. Adversus marcionem libri v. Adversus valentinianos. Adversus judios. De anima. De carni Christi. De resurrection carnis, on moralitide velandis virginibus. De exhortatione castitatis. De monogamia. De jejunis. De pedicitia. De palio. Topic possible chronology The following chronological ordering was proposed by John Kay, Bishop of Lincoln in the 19th century, probably mainstream, pre-Montanist, 1. De poenitentia on repentance, 2. De oratione on prayer, 3. De baptismo on baptism, 4, 5. Ad uxorum, lib. I and 2, to his wife, 6. Ad martyrs to the martyrs, 7. De patientia on patience, 8. Adversus judios against the Jews, 9. De prescription hereticorum on the prescription of heretics, indeterminate, 10. Apologeticus pro Christianis, apology for the Christians, 11, 12. Ad nationis, lib. I and 2 to the nations, 13. De testimonio anime on the witness of the soul 14. De palio on the ascetic mantle 15. Adversus hermogenum against hermogenes probably post montanist 16. Adversus valentinianus against the valentinians 17. Ad scapulum to scapula proconsul of Africa 18. De spectaculus on the games 19. De idololatria on idolatry 20, 21. De cultu feminarum, lib. I and 2 on women's dress, definitely post-Montanist, 22. 
Advesus Marcionem, Libi against Marcion, BK. I, 23. Advesus Marcionem, Lib. 2.24. De Anima on the Soul, 25. Advesus Marcionem, Lib. 3.26. Advesus Marcionem, Lib. IV 27. De Carni Christi on the Flesh of Christ, 28. De Resurrection Carnis on the Resurrection of Flesh, 29. Advesus Marcionem, Lib. V. 30. Advesus Praxion against Praxeus, 31. Scorpius, Antidote to Scorpion's Bite, 32. De Corona Melitus on the Soldier's Garland, 33. De Velandis Virginibus on Veiling Virgins, 34. De Exhortatione Castitatis on Exhortation to Chastity, 35. De Fuga in Persecutione on Flight in Persecution, 36. De Monogamia on Monogamy, 37. De Jejunis, Adversus Psychicos on Fasting, Against the Materialists, 38. De Pudaticia on Modesty. Topic: Spurious works. There have been many works attributed to Tertullian in the past, which have since been determined to be almost definitely written by others. Nonetheless, since their actual authors remain uncertain, they continue to be published together in collections of Tertullian's works. One. Adversus Oms Heresies against all heresies Pos. Victorinus of Petau 2 De Execrandis Gentium Diis on the execrable gods of the heathens 3 Carmen Adversus Marcionem Poem against Marcion 4 Carmen De Iona Propheta Poem about the prophet Jonas Pos. Cyprianus Gallus 5 Carmen de Sodoma poem about Sodom pos Cyprianus Gallus 6 Carmen de Genesi poem about Genesis 7 Carmen de Judicio Domini poem about the judgment of the Lord the popular Passio SS Perpetuae Felicitatis martyrdom of SS Perpetua and Felicitas, much of it the personal diary of Saint Perpetua, was once assumed to have been edited by Tertullian. That view is no longer held, and it is usually published separately from Tertullian's works. See also Christian pacifism Septimia, Gens Pseudo-Tertullian Tertullia Early Christian descriptions of the execution cross Notes <laughs> 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 <laughs>